couple of years ago, I was born in uh, a community. And this morning, I want us to look at uh, who is my neighbor. In the community where I was born, um, and, and I know it was God's plan, um, because God has designed that we, 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 we live within a community. Many times I ask myself, what would happen if, if, if we didn't have people around us and God just allowed you to be the one who lives in Kenya? And Kenya, Ikona, Mtu Moja, Tanzania, Mtu Moja, Uganda, Mtu Moja. Um, what would have happened? You know, a lot of the things that we do, we wouldn't be doing them. Like, for example, if you're the only one who lived in Kenya, why would you need to, to even have security? Why would you even need to build a house? And many other things that uh, we might not say here. Um, but because God has put us in a community, and God is a, a God of community from the word go, it is important for us to know how to live within the community. So God creates us, and, and as he creates, by the way, from the word go, God starts with, with the community. God says, let us uh, create. He, he, within his community, created and the community of God, like you would uh, understand, is me, is, is the Holy Spirit, God, God the Father, and God the Son. So God is, is a community as he begins to uh, come through to us. And so the idea of, of God seems to be that we shall not just live alone, we will live within a community. He exemplifies that uh, in his uh, Godhead. And he says, let us, he says, let us create man. It is in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number 26. Scripture says, uh, if you would give us Genesis chapter one and verse number 26, he says, God said, let us. Now, right from there, God, God is telling us that he's not alone. He's a community. He's, 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 he's looking at things from a different perspective. He says, let us uh, make man in our image, uh, like in our likeness, so that they may rule. At that point, the man that God created, we know when God creates, the person that we see is one man, but he says, they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock. My idea was that we need to see God working through a community. He didn't expect man to be alone, and of course, further as we continue, he emphasizes the need of being in a community. When he creates Adam, a wife. He creates Adam, a wife, in the book of Second uh, Genesis, chapter number two, and verse number twenty-one. He says, "And the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Immediately after that, then a woman appears, and as it were, the man is not supposed to be living alone. And so God is concerned." God is interested in the community. God is a God of community. No wonder we speak about God as being generational because uh, what he started many, many years ago, since the beginning, his idea from the beginning was that man would come into the space and, and multiply and have dominion and increase, be fruitful. Part of being fruitful Part of multiplying was that man would procreate and bring his own kind. It's interesting when you read the story of, of, of creation and you see um, God allowing man to have dominion and to rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and all that he had created. But even after all that, he gets to a point and sees this man is not fulfilled. Those are my words. This man is not complete. And so he decides to create a helpmeet for the man who was suitable. Remember, all this while, God has allowed Adam to name the animals. And what interests me today is that since then, we have not changed. What Adam named them, we haven't changed. We might have different translations for those animals depending on where we are coming from, but we, we, I am not even sure we will have a referendum on 
can we change the, the elephant now? It has been an elephant for so long. What he called the animals remains to date. Now, that tells me that when man is coming into the scene, he didn't just come. God had a purpose. God had a plan, a very well-spelled out plan. And this morning, we want to look at that community. And we'll look at the community in a way of asking ourselves, who is your neighbor? In the last couple of days, I've been looking at a series on who is, who is my neighbor. The definition that you get of your neighbor from the dictionary says that a um, neighbor is a person living next door or very near to you. The person who lives next door or very near to you. Um, the Bible definition of, of neighbor is a, a little bit different from what the dictionary would say. Because come, growing up and, and coming to the space that we are in, if you asked any one of us today, who is your neighbor? They will most likely turn to the left or to the right, or they'll go back at home, they'll go back to the estate where they live, and they'll tell you, my neighbor is so-and-so. They're actually definite about who their neighbor is. If you go to the rural um, places, and you ask about neighbors, they will tell you your neighbor, and of course they will add that other story, because in the rural areas there is a story. Every rural area has a story. The neighbor on this, in fact, when they are describing the neighbor, they have to say the neighbor who does this and that. The neighbor who always allows his animals to come graze in our fields. The neighbor who always doesn't know how to do this and that. And so the neighbor that we know is that neighbor, and that's, that's what we've been taught uh, as we grew up. But scripture tells us different. And so I want us to look at uh, scriptures in the book of Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 25 through to 37. The Bible records in this portion of scripture, as uh, like we're going to see, that your neighbor is not just that person who sits or who is your next door neighbor. And the, 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 the passage that we're about to read, this is Jesus and he's engaging with um, a teacher, uh, or he's engaging with a lawyer, uh, an expert of the law. And the question that this lawyer asks, you know lawyers ask questions? Have you met a lawyer? So, in this scripture, um, Jesus has been out doing ministry, sent um, his disciples, the 72, and then as they went preaching and they were going before him the places that he was now to come and do ministry, he meets this uh, uh, lawyer. And scripture says in verse number 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law. Now, this was not just a beginner. He was an expert in the law. Maybe in our, in our day, he was not just any other lawyer. He was not... He was, not, uh, he was admitted to the bar. He was, he was a senior counsel, if you'd want. You know senior counsels? Yes, they're very senior. So he meets this um, lawyer. He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So the lawyer is coming. His intent is to test Jesus. And he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Verse number 26 says, and this is Jesus, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Verse number 27, the lawyer says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as well, or as yourself. He says in verse number 28, Jesus now answers to the, the expert of the law and says, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied. He says, he says to him, do this, and you will live. Do what you have said. Do the answer that you have given, and you will live. Verse number 29 says, but he wanted to justify himself Remember, we're dealing with a lawyer here and they ask questions. So he asked Jesus, 
And who is my neighbor? Remember, he's the one who said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your da -da -da, all that. And then he added, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then he continues to ask Jesus, so who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, now, I, I love the way Jesus answered these questions because, you know, Jesus, when he dealt with a farmer, he would talk about uh, the fields, the crops, the animals. Now, he has met a lawyer. Now, this lawyer didn't know that Jesus is our advocate. He just thought he's another young man who has come into the scene, another And Jesus engages this man in the language of the law. He says, he didn't answer direct. He actually came to the scripture that is the parable of the Samaritan. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him off his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32 says, So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look at him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the men who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse number 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, in this, in this uh, portion of scripture, we see a story or we and this is a parable that Jesus taught. And he was trying to answer the question. What was our question? Our question is not who is my neighbor. Our question was, what must I do to have eternal life? Remember, that's a question that the expert uh, of the law asked. And then he provided the answer. And then within the answer, he asks Jesus, then, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gives this story. And Jesus says, um, when, 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 when the lawyer says, the one who showed mercy, then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So that you can inherit eternal life. Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. Go and show mercy. Go and have pity on that person who is needy. Realize this, that anybody who is in need, as far as scripture is concerned, and as far as this parable is concerned, and the discourse that Jesus had with the expert, then that person becomes your neighbor. Your neighbor is not just a person who is your next door neighbor. Your neighbor is not just that troublesome neighbor at the village. Your neighbor is anyone who has need. Now, we have many people who are needy, isn't it? Does that mean that they are neighbors? Immediately, God allows you to know that somebody has a need, then that becomes your neighbor. Now, I know some of us have so many needy neighbors. 
and some of us know somebody who is in need, but we thought that was not our portion. I'm here to tell us, and as I speak to you, I'm also speaking to myself, because you know many times we meet people who have needs, but we think that need will be met by so-and-so. In actual fact, we pray for them that God would come and meet their need. So the limited understanding that we have of who our neighbor is, is challenged by scripture. And scripture tells us explicitly that anybody who has need and God, for some reason or the other, allowed you to come to the knowledge of that, that need, then that becomes a person that you need to attend to. And this is the neighbor as far as scripture is concerned. We have neighbors. We have people who are needy. We have people who have come to us. We have gotten to know of their need through somebody. In, in our church here, and I love the way we do things here, when there is a need, that, that need that all of us get involved in, we create links and we invite people to come in and help that neighbor. Now, shall I say this? It is okay. Being born again is good. But there is an element of your inheriting eternal life that is tied to helping your neighbor. Ah, look at the person who is seated next to you. When was the last time that you helped your neighbor? Some of us cannot even remember. When was the last time that you saw that link? Yeah? That, that family that was asking for help, that, that young man, that... And you're saying, this one, I don't even know them. I don't know them. I'm here to tell you that that is your neighbor. Scripture expects us to meet the need of that neighbor. So the next time you see those links coming through, please do not think this is for so and so. It is not for the pastors. It is not just for the leaders. It is not for the cell leader. It is for you who saw it. God in his own way allowed you to know that there was somebody in need. Can you imagine these, these three people who are going to their businesses? And then they meet this person who was beaten up by robbers. And important people, aren't they? Are Levites. Are men of God. Aren't these good people? But Jesus disqualifies them and says the Samaritan. Now, you don't want to go back into the history of the Samaritan and how they related with the Jews. But that notwithstanding, Jesus says, this is your neighbor. Now, if you deal with them rightly, then inheriting eternal life is yours. I'm not saying that you will not inherit eternal life. In fact, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you're already living eternally. But there, there remains a manifestation. There is a day that that will be manifested. When we are done with this life and we present ourselves before the Lord because our assignment will have been done, there remains that day. You know, there are people who believe that once saved, always saved. Mimi ni liokoka. Na kwa sababu qualification ya kwenda biguni ni kuokoka. Sasa ni miokoka. Let me go and do life. You live the way you want because you got saved and the qualification of going to heaven is getting saved. The truth is, it is possible to lose your salvation along the way depending on how you do life. And one of the ways is how we treat our neighbor. Now, when, when God allows us to know these things, he doesn't just allow us to know for the sake of knowing. He wants us to know that our neighbor is so and so because they have a need and because you got to know it. And after that, move and do something about it. Now, the neighbor that we see here, when he found this man who was beaten up by robbers, we do not know where he was going, the Samaritan, but he was on his errands. He stopped, 
took the man that was beaten up by robbers, put him in his expensive car. That time the car was a donkey. Anybody who had a donkey, they were doing very well, isn't it? In actual fact, Jesus himself rode on a donkey. And, and the one that was Jesus was borrowed. But when we meet people with need, what do we do first? We look at my assignment for today. I'm actually going to preach in the first service, so um, somebody else can take care of this. You look at the inconvenience that they're going to cause. You look at, of course, somebody who is beaten up by robbers, if you have seen one, they are not as clean as you are. They are bleeding. They are dirty. Maybe because of the way they dealt with the, this man, they, they, they threw him in the, in, the, in the trenches. And if it was like Zimmerman, then he has sewage all over. And you are clean. You are going to church. <laughs> you are thinking, church, now who you to? Na sewage. What I'm saying is that we need to be sensitive to the plight of the people that God has allowed us to know. I'm not saying that when you're coming to church on Sunday, then you'll be going around Zimmerman looking for Nani Alipi, you Siku. No. How do you treat that person who has who has need? And so God expects you to do something. The example that we have in this uh, parable, it says this man was taken and he rode on uh, the Samaritan's donkey. He bandaged the person up, put oil and wine. It's okay to spend some oil and some wine. And then he takes him to an inn and tells the innkeeper, take care of this person. I was on my journey to do this and that, but take care of him. And he gives two denarii. And he says, when I go and come back, if he shall have spent more than what I have left, I'll be ready to take care of it. I, I, I'm sure they were not behaving like, you know, when you think about that and, and you're thinking about our situation today in Kenya, if you take somebody to hospital, Number one, we don't say we are going to pay for them, do we? We take them to hospital to dump them, just in case say, something happens. We take them there. Of course, it's a good thing to take them there because that they will receive help. But the person who is receiving them tells them, have you paid uko na NHIF? Umeka deposit. They are not interested in saving the life. This innkeeper was given two denarii, just in case he behaved like Kenyans, said, this is money, take care of this man. And when I come back, if there be any other bill, I'll meet it. Tell your neighbor it is okay to spend a denarii on your neighbor. I know when it comes to issues of money, now that is where we, yeah, we start, because money is precious, isn't it? One day, growing up, um, my mother told me, I have a lot of influence from my mother, and thank God for the mothers who are here. Oh, I mean it. My mother told me one day, son, money is good. And it is good, isn't it? We agree. But if, and this was in relation to, to to the life that you and your spouse have. So he, he, she was advising me on how to deal with money uh, even as Esther comes into the scene. Ooh. She tells me, if you realize that you have married a wife, and of course, if you're here, you are a wife, you realize that you have married a husband who loves money, 
to the extent that you're going to have problems, then be the person to hate that money. Now, hating the money doesn't mean that you don't look for it, but don't be concerned about the money more than the relationship. Wisdom. Wisdom. And I remember that even to date. Do I practice? Yeah. <laughs> so this man knew how to deal with money. He didn't love money more than the relationship. He was willing to spend his money. The call is that you and I need to get to that place. Those of us who have come into the Father's vision, and, and yesterday we of us were seated in a place that we were reminding ourselves about these things. We said, in the Father's vision, you spend, you spend and you get spent. The Father's vision, you will spend your money. You will spend your money on, on people that God will allow you to meet along the way. But you will also be spent because when you have come into the Father's vision and you have become a father, you have become a mother, you are mothering people, you are fathering people, they will call you at any time. How many know pastors don't sleep? It's a lie. Pastors sleep. But you know when you call the pastor, the pastor doesn't answer and say, excuse me, I'm sleeping. If your call goes through, the pastor will pick the call. At two, and I'm not complaining, at one, we are fighting with my wife. We are headed to hospital. You need to pray for us. Now, the call that we have, and especially those of us that are coming into the Father's vision, is that you will be spent. And this is the deal. This is what you are getting into. Even as we deal with our neighbors, be willing to spend and be spent. Do not love yourself more than your neighbor. That is what, that is what uh, the, the, the lawyer uh, says. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you love yourself, you need to love your neighbor. And that, like I said, has an element of qualifying you to eternal life. So be willing to spend a coin or two, maybe a thousand, <laughs> because God has allowed you to know that your neighbor is in need. I've said enough times that your inheritance of eternal life has a bearing with the way you treat your neighbor. Now, if we go back to the neighborhood where we are, and with the understanding that our neighbor is not just that person who is next door. Yes, they are our neighbor because when they are in need, you will attend to them. But also the fact that God has placed us within this community of people, then we need to know that eternal life is tied into the way we deal with our neighbors. How do we treat our neighbors? Some of us, because your neighbor is not born again and they don't belong to your church, we don't talk to them, we don't even say hi to them. Now, of course, there are neighbors who are difficult. But if you are a Christian, does it hurt to say hi to a neighbor? Enough times I have realized that when we go out for door to door, it is a very, very good exercise. But the people that will open the doors for you, most likely are people who have seen you around. Most likely are people who have identified you and they have said, now this one I know. This one lives around. This one does. This one. In this city that we are living in, when you go knocking into people's doors, the first suspicion that they have is what does this one want? Who are they? Where are they coming from? 
and we are there saying, we are from DCIKZ, we are coming to tell you about the love of Jesus. And then they tell you, I am going to come to church. I will bring myself there. Because they don't know you. But had you been their neighbor next door, and you knocked in their houses, because, you know, when they had need, you attended to them. When they had this situation going, you, you were available for them. You dealt with your neighbor the way scriptures would. They will open their door, and you will be able to minister to them. In actual fact, you don't need to say anything. You only need to, to live out the life that God has brought you in, and they will see. Now, dealing with our neighbors, there is one killer of that good neighborhoodness that is both physical, meaning where you are living, and this other one that we have realized from scripture has broadened the boundaries to the person who has need. One of the killers to that good neighborhoodness is something we call suspicion. Najoku suspect. You know suspicion? Ah. And you know life has taught us as we were growing up, even in school. In school, we, 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 for some reason, when we went to high school, secondary school, there were some boys who had uh, um, perfected the art of breaking into other people's boxes. If you went to a boarding school, you can identify with this. And that time, we used to have um, boxes made of, of, of mabati. Met, is it metal? Is it? Hey, here, mabati. And for you to lock it, there was a place at the middle where you would lock and have a padlock. Hmm? Your tricycle. <laughs> tricycle. Those guys didn't need the key. They would come and hit the box right at the middle. And then the box gave way, both sides. From those experiences, even in school, you would go and report. Um, and it, it, where, where we went to school, this used to happen. It would be like, you know, updating us on the state of security in the school. And so you'd be told during the parade, three boxes were broken in Kimathi house. There was a house called Kimathi. Two boxes were broken in Wambogo house. One box was broken in Kefoy. <laughs> those, those were the names of where I went to school. <laughs> the, the domes. <laughs> those were the domes. Wabogo. Wagura. Kefoy. I know you as were cool. And from that moment, we were taught to suspect people. So you'd go and report, my box was broken into. And you're starting from the lowest way, the, the lowest level of authority in school where we have the prefect. So you'd go to the prefect, the dorm captain, and then you'd report. Um, and then he asked, do you have any suspect? And then we, we go to the teacher. So who are the suspects? And you know how we used to do that? You would look at the people that you think. The people you don't like. The people who behave in a certain way. And you would say, I suspect so and so. Now, suspicion is sin. Up to and until when somebody is guilty of the offense, when you suspect them, you've already profiled them. And you know that affects the way you relate with them from that point. It, it is not just affecting your relationship with them. Even their response to what you will do from that point onwards. And you, you know we have grown into it. We suspect brothers and sisters. I suspect he's, he's doing this and that. I suspect he's drinking. What is your problem? I suspect he's going to divine us. Excuse me. Do you know? Now, the scene of suspicion is so subtle. And many of us think, and I told you, as I preach this, I'm preaching to myself. 
you, you will think you want to help the brother. I, you're suspecting that he has married another wife. You don't know, you're suspecting. But right from that point where you're suspecting, you treat them like... Now, in scripture, in the book of First Psalm, chapter number nine, chapter number eighteen, and verse number nine, we have Saul and David. There is one guy who is a king. There is another guy who is waiting to become the king. Now, the king, and they go to war. Um, the scripture that we, we have, we might not have enough time to read that. Uh, but in verse, if you read from verse number 6 through to 9, it says, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his 10,000, that was wrong. That song that women sang was wrong. Anyhow, women will not wait to be coached, to go for training, to go for practice when something good happens. They will just burst in song. But David, I'm sure where he was seated, he was like, guys, just stop this singing, stop it. Because it is a song that landed him into problems. How is it possible that the king has slayed just a few? And this, this boy who is yeah, tens of thousands. And they sang and they were jubilant. If you read, verse number 8 says, So was very angry. Very angry at what happened. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But actually, that is what had happened. But me, with only thousands, what more can he get but the kingdom? Now, verse number nine says, And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. You know when you keep a close eye on somebody? It's because you are suspecting. I'm, I'm, I'm watching you. So, his suspicion, that eye that he kept looking at David with, causes David a lot of problems. You and I now know because we are reading it from here, isn't it? Don't we understand? This is Saul. We can almost understand what was happening in Saul. And this is David. And we know as we read the story that this guy is clean. He has a clean heart. But this one, Saul doesn't know. He's looking at David like, okay, oh, you did it. Even the women sang. So what else are you up to? The scene of suspicion. You treat people with suspect. That is not the way to treat neighbors. That is not the way God wants us to treat each other. Brothers and sisters, we need to treat each other with love. Granted that they were the suspect and even became the culprit. The culprit. Now, if they were the culprit, even after that, God requires that we restore them. So there is no place of remaining at that point of, I suspected him. You be the culprit and you're discharged, so I have nothing to do with you. And that speaks to us on how we deal with each other. Even when we are dealing with one of us who is fallen. We will restore them to the place that God wants them to get. And so the call this morning is that you and I, learning from the story of the Samaritan woman, of, of the good Samaritan, sorry, that we would come to a place where we know that God allows us to know these things because there is something that God knows you can do in the life of that person who has need. 
we are learning that your neighbor is not just that person who is your next door neighbor. Yes, that one, but much more the person who is in need. And the need that that person has, you are able to meet it fully or partially. The truth of the matter is, God is not calling us to meet all the needs that people have, but God is calling us not to be indifferent. Do not be aloof. Do not be indifferent when people are going through stuff. Your help, your willingness to be part of the help is what counts. I, I, I know we will get to heaven someday. But I don't know how we are going to deal with this. That you are in heaven. Sister so and so. You have landed. See, and it will be a surprise for us to be there. Ukijijua, we unajijua vile uko. Si unajijua. You find yourself in heaven. You'll be like, wow. Oh God, thank you. And then you see sister so and so. And thinking, this is my imagination, that God will be saying, oh, so and so, you helped so and so, you helped so and so, you helped so and so. And then you are you're, you're rewarded in a certain way. But there will be those who never helped nobody. Say, me and Mefika Benguni peke yangu. Si jasaidia mtu kwa hiyo dunia. I don't know whether heaven will be lonely. Let's go out there, have a heart for people. God is a God of community. God has placed you in a family. God has placed you in a place of business, in a place of work. That is a place where God needs to be known through the way you live with the people around you. I think it's St. Francis of Assisi who says, we will preach and uh, uh, we're required to speak, then we will. Simply saying that the way you live out your life as a Christian speaks volumes to the people around you. We will witness, and if need be, we'll use words. Well, that is, that is, that is a good saying of St. Francis of Assisi, but we know that we have been called to be witnesses. We will witness. We will talk about Jesus and the good things that he has done. But isn't it true that people will look at you, will look at the life that you lead, and desire to know what is this that has caused the difference in his life? in her life, and then as they come close to you, you point them to Jesus. Now, some of us are too loud about Jesus, but our lives are different. The way you live with people, the way you interact with your neighbor, now we have a different definition or an added definition of who a neighbor is, has an element tied to it that is of eternal value. And maybe you are here this morning and you are saying, oh, you've been talking about neighbors. You've been talking about helping people. I have not been found in those places. I know that people are in need. I have seen places that I needed to plug into. But I have not, for the life of myself, done that. One of you. Realize also that this understanding doesn't just come from mental um, intelligence. It comes from a life that has been changed, a life that has been transformed. And so it starts with knowing the love of Jesus. It starts with knowing Jesus, Jesus realized that we were in need. He came, died for us, gave all that he had for you and me so that we would be found in the kingdom of God. It is not possible for you to treat people the way God wants you to treat them until you have received his love then you can extend it to others. Because this is the love that we have received. So are you here? And you have not committed your life to Jesus. You have not started this journey. You have not subscribed to the love that Jesus has shown towards us. But you say, I'm a good person. All those things that he was talking about, I do. You and the expert of the law. You need to get to the place of yielding to the Lord Jesus. And as we bring this to a close, I want to ask, you are here, you have not committed your life to Jesus. This thing is serious. This is about life. This life and eternal life because there is a day that is coming and we'll be out of this life. Refuse to believe the lie of the people. 
believe what scripture says. There is a day that is coming. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Are you there? You have not given your life to Jesus. And you do want us to pray together. And then from today, you commit your life to the Lord. And then we can walk this journey together. As I invite uh, the ministry team also to come. And the worship team to be on stage. Are you there? You have not given your life to Jesus. We want to pray together with you. If you lift up your hand, we'll see it. We will pray together with you. You'll be enlisted in God's kingdom. Or oh, you're there and you have a need. Whatever need it is, you want to come to the front and agree with these men and women of God concerning the situation that you find yourself in. Are you looking for that transformation? You're saying, I know myself, I need God to touch me. I need God to touch me as concerns dealing with people. This would be an opportune moment for you. Hallelujah. You came in and you had a need and you wanted to agree with somebody concerning that need. This is your time. You're facing a situation and you do not know what to do. It's somebody who will agree with you as you believe God together.